why did you pursue music as a career? Well, you know, Warren, you don't choose music. Music chooses. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> there was a rapper who said that. I, I don't choose rhyme. Rhyme and choose me. <laughs> so music just chose you. How? What, what age did you start playing piano? Um, I was well. I I, I was lucky. Believe I, I know how lucky I was. We I grew up in a house that had a grand piano in it. Uh -huh. And um, even though, you know, I, nobody was a professional musician, it's just my mother had a, a baby grand chickering. And I also grew up in a house with a bunch of kids. There were six of us. So it was a big, wow. noisy house. And the piano was in the living room with the TV and the radio and the stereo and the dog and the kids and everything else. And I was kind of an introvert. So for me, the piano was the place I would go to be alone in the middle of the bedlam, even though the piano was in the middle of the bedlam. If I was playing the piano, I felt like I had my own space in my own private place. So I started playing the piano when I was five, just messing around, you know, composing little pieces. And um, my mother didn't want me to start until I was six. And when I was six, she took me to the local music store. And I took lessons with a lady who had fingernails this long. <laughs> so it was all playing like that, flat fingers? <laughs> yeah, accordion. And <laughs> so my brother was studying accordion and I was studying piano. And I, I took, and the good thing about her, I mean, I owe her a debt. Her name was, I think her name was Doris. Um, she she left me alone. She let me play as fast as I wanted to. And I was a little speed demon. So that was a good thing. She didn't, you know, try to slow me down. I learned to read music pretty quickly, kind of just on my own, you know, with her using, you know, music. But she she let me fly. And that was what I needed to do when I was six. I kind of just wanted to play fast. So when I was eight, I played for a... a a parent teacher organization uh, meeting, you know, in the, in the elementary school gym on an upright piano. And by the grace of God, there was someone there who came up to my mother afterwards and said, your daughter has talent and she needs a better teacher. So call this name, call this phone number. Uh. It happened to be one of the very top teachers, um, this phone number was of Rebecca Froman, who was one of the top teachers in Michigan at the time. And I, I mean, I was in Detroit and Detroit is a very strong music city, as you know, not just with Motown and, and everything else like that at the time, this was in the sixties, but also classical. It was, you know, the Detroit symphony and a tremendous place to grow up as a musician. I was so lucky. And this teacher was outstanding. And um, so I studied with her for 10 years, from age 8 to 18. I was so lucky. I had a great teacher as a kid. Wow. So, you know, and I know what that means because uh -huh. the, I know what it means, what, what you were up against in your background starting really at age 18. Oh, yeah. And, I knew. But, you know, you did it. Yes. You really did it, Warren. <laughs> I always I always wanted to study music, just never had the opportunity. So when the opportunity came, I I latched on with my life, said, you know, because there was really nothing else that interested me. Yeah, well, I remember when I first met you in Jamaica and you know, it was like, where's Warren? He's practicing. He's always practicing. Because I always because you practiced all the time. <laughs> I always felt like I needed to catch up. You know, when I started Edna Manley College, so many other players had decade, at least a decade of lessons and teaching and all of that. I didn't have any of that stuff. So, you know, it was either I catch up or fall, continue to fall behind. So I, I was always practicing. And you're a testament to the benefits of really hard work. You worked harder than anybody, any Thank student. You. And it shows. 
really shows. You became a wonderful classical player. <laughs> I want all those people out there to know that. I want them to hear yeah. your songs yeah. someday. <laughs> I'll have to whip, whip out some of those pieces again at some point. When I get an actual piano to practice on, because I, I, it's, not, it's not the same playing that stuff on keyboards. Right. But, you know, I looked up some, like when, when you asked me to do this interview, I looked up some of your old programs. I still have them. Oh, wow. Do you have copies? I, I Probably somewhere in a box. <laughs> I'll send you them. Uh, those were difficult programs. Your junior recital, you played a full junior recital. You didn't need to, but you did. You know, it was a full hour. And in your senior recital, that was some very difficult music you played. I still remember that Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That piece was both magnificent but difficult because so much, so, mu so much of the piece lived on the black keys. Yeah. And I was sweating because that was like what? May? Yeah. So it was hot. And I was wearing a jacket suit. You're nervous. Coming. What do you mean it was hot? At, at that point, my body is already acc acclimated. I was a mainer at that point. <laughs> but, you know, whenever I have to perform, I get nervous and my hands just won't stop sweating. So it was just, you know, trying to move across those black keys where it was like oil dripping from my fingers it was not easy. But I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. It was definitely fun. I learned a lot studying classical and just the, dis the sheer discipline of being a classical musician. It's, I, 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 you know, I respect people who do that stuff for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. To be honest, at the end, I was a little burnt out. <laughs> I can imagine. Because I did eight consecutive years, but I believe you did, what, like 12 years straight? 11. 11. You weren't well, burnt I, out again? I took, in my, while I was doing my doctorate, I got a teaching position at Albion College in Michigan. And so I didn't teach that year. So it was in the middle of my doctorate. But um, other than that, yeah, it was just three degrees straight in a row. Well, it was the only way to do it. I think, you know, <laughs> you know, it was like, if I don't do it now, I'll never get, I'll never do it. And, and in, if you're in classical, you know, the cl field of classical. Yeah. And you want to end up teaching at a university, you really have to get a doctorate. And so, you know. So that was your long-term goal. I was like, I'm just get a doctorate, teach in a university. Well, I wanted to be able to support myself. Mm -hmm. And the field of classical music, that's next to impossible. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's a very tough profession. An awful lot of people freelance. They teach privately and they, they make a go of it. Um, I was hoping, I knew that that was going to be an option if I didn't get a college teaching job. And I really wanted to get a college teaching job because the kinds of students I wanted to teach were the advanced level students. So you wanted to teach performers? I did. And I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky again to have a studio full of people like that. And it's really, I, I count my lucky stars because, you know, <laughs> I, I like teaching kids, <clears throat> but I just think I'm better at working. I think my people are the 18 to 35 you know, age 18 to 35 crowd and older even sort of that's, those are the people that I can more easily relate to. Yeah. There was a time when you, sorry, you were saying something? I'm nothing against teaching kids. Okay. I, there was a time when you were doing a lot of concerts, solo concerts, right? Yeah. What was that about? <laughs> was this well, blowing steam or you were, trying to really go for it? Well, I mean, I don't see that it's one or the other. I mean, I still perform. Yeah. Uh -huh. Never stopped performing. And I also teach. I mean, okay, Warren, did you know that Liszt retired from the, the concert stage in his mid-30s? No. He did. Franz wow. Liszt. Yeah, the greatest pianist of the, the 19th century by all, you know, all, by all the people that heard him, they said that. But <laughs> we don't know because we can't hear him. But, uh, yeah, he retired from concertizing in his mid-30s and then taught for the rest of his life. 
taught and composed, mostly composed for a while. And then eventually, you know, really, really taught. It's not, there's not a conflict here, really. Yeah. Not most one people do it. And most people who, most of the great teachers definitely have had a performing career behind them. Um, you know, and most of uh, many, many, if not most of the great performers also teach. So I think it's just, you know, we're, we're obligated to teach. I think there, the people feel that. They you know, want the next generation to preserve this art form. You're going to have to teach it to them. Yeah. So I, you know, I concertized more before I got the job at the University of Southern Maine because I had more time. Once I started full-time teaching, I just didn't have as much time to practice and to, you know, travel. I kept doing it, though. What I, really kind of slowed it down was having a kid, you know, having a, uh, a child more than anything else that, you know, it made it more and more difficult to travel. When, I, when we met, you were still doing concerts. I, I don't know how much concerts you were doing a year back then. Probably like five, six like big concerts. So you, like 2006, 2008 in there? Yeah. So you were doing, you were doing that while teaching full time or while raising a son. How do you juggle all that stuff? I mean, some of the pieces you played, I would sit there and think, how did you get time to even learn that amidst everything else you were doing? <laughs> how did you juggle all of that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> When I think back, I mean, having a child changes your life so much. Uh-huh. You just don't have time for anything anymore. I'm feeling and it now. <laughs> I remember when Gabriel was born uh, in the first year of his life, I got an electric keyboard because I couldn't, you know, if I practiced, he would, he would, he couldn't sleep through it. Um, and so I, I got an electronic keyboard and, put the headphones on and that's what I did for that first year, you know, just to, just to get through that year. But I, I don't know how I did. I, I honestly don't know. Cause I, you know, the full-time job, the trying to keep performing and raising a child, um, it's hard. I don't know. I, I, I wish I could tell you how I did. I guess I didn't sleep a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I always I, I always thought about just because at that time of my life, my my only goal, my only responsibility was to go to classes, practice, go to classes, practice. And I felt like there's not enough time in the day while you over here juggling all these things while teaching. At that time, you had it was like 12 of us in the studio or something. Probably. That was insane. And every year somebody was doing a recital or preparing for a concert so it, it, it was very impressive just watching you do all of that i didn't know you noticed yeah that's partly why i pulled through because i'm like if laura can do all of this stuff <laughs> and i just have one job learn my pieces and do a recital then i <laughs> i had to step up to the plate yeah but you also were teaching salsa for fun that was like me you know Blowing off steam, you know, getting and you away. Had a job too, on the side. I remember you had yes. a job. You were working a lot. At one point, I started working with the landscaping department, and that's when I had to shovel snow in the winter. The Jamaican had to come to Maine <laughs> to shovel snow. That toughened me up real quick, <laughs> you know, because I needed the cash. You know, I needed the because the scholarships that I was fortunate to get covers the tuition and the dorms, but just regular spending money i needed i needed um a job and that was the only job on campus that was flexible for musicians because we needed to practice we needed to do classes and all of that working with the landscaping department you could basically build your hours around your classes and practice schedule so i did it for four years i believe i worked with that department it was good it was good it's not a great job for a pianist unless you're really strong. We were other- working with dangerous tools too a lot of the times, you know, <laughs> chairs and, but it was, it was, it was an experience. It was such a good experience. So from Detroit, Michigan to Jamaica, 
when when did you end up in Jamaica? Was it in the late eighties or the nineties? It was uh, eighty seven uh, to eighty eight. How did that happen? Well, I I got my doctorate in eighty five, I think, and I start. That's when I really started to play a lot, and I was in Europe a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was also doing some international competitions. And so I was practicing all the time, traveling a lot, playing a lot. And that summer of 1987, I spent in Europe and then I came back in the fall. And I was kind of looking for a job. Like, not, I mean, at that point in time, I was kind of, you know, thinking, I don't really want a job right now because I want to keep doing what I'm doing. But, you know, I'm, I'm an adult and I. <laughs> so I started, I looked, you know, and of course, there are no job openings in October. Right. I, I this was I looked at the College Music Society, was looking for jobs for the following year because they start posting them in October. Well, lo and behold, there was a job opening, immediate opening at what they, Edna Manley College, which at that point was called uh, Cultural Training Center of the Caribbean. Uh-huh. And there was a job opening for like, you know, can you get down here next week kind of job opening. So I called the number and um, I was hired over the phone. You weren't like a little nervous, like white girl from Michigan going to Kingston, Jamaica in the 80s? That helped a little bit. It was a day, you know, Detroit was also a dangerous city. So I know- You're kind of used to it. I did my research on Kingston. I found out, oh, it's a dangerous city. Well, you know, from Detroit, I can can deal with that. Um, I just, I'm, all I can say is, Thank God I did it because it was, I rated up there with like the top five best things I ever did in my life. Wow. You know, along with having a child, you know, (laughs) going to Jamaica changed my life, completely changed my life, changed the course of my life. It changed the way I saw my role as a musician. You know, I went someplace, first of all, I, I, you know, I had gone to, you know, one of the major piano programs in the country, if not the world. The University of Michigan had incredible piano program. And the teachers I had were world class. So there were all these other pianists that were friends of mine and colleagues of mine who were all looking for the same thing. And they were all super talented and and so accomplished. Mm-hmm. And you felt like, you know, coming out of that environment, you're thinking, well, there's this school and then there are all the kids coming out of Juilliard and all the kids coming out of Eastman and all the kids coming out of Indiana, et cetera, you know, and we're all looking for jobs and we're all looking for the same thing. And there's too many of us and there aren't (laughs) enough jobs and there aren't enough competitions for all of us to win. And it, it's an intensely competitive field and you really feel like, well, I'm not needed in this. This is, this is silly, you know. I'm I'm in a profession where there really is no crying need for me. And then I went to Jamaica, and for the first time in my life, I could see that if you're in the right place, even as a classical musician, you can be desperately needed. Yeah. And because there were people like you, and who were dying for this, you know. I had some students who didn't have, didn't have pianos. They were drawing the picture of a keyboard and putting it on their tabletop and practicing on that. Uh. I'm sure you know people like that in Jamaica. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and, you know, or would be taking one of the country buses through the mountains for two hours. To get to school. For a half-hour lesson at the college. Come rain or come shine, you know, that's how they valued it. I saw how spoiled we are in America. That was really important for me to see. Uh When I came out of Kingston, the first time I flew home from there and I walked, just walking into an American airport after having spent months in Kingston and just 
seeing all the stuff, you know, that you can buy so easily in the United States. Um, going into a grocery store and seeing what you could so easily buy here. And it was, you know, it was really like the third world to be uh-huh. Eastern in those days. And so there was that part of it, you know, the economic disparity, um, the lack of opportunities in in Jamaica for the really talented musicians. They, I felt needed. And that changed the way I saw my role. And it, it gave teaching a meaning, which I've been able to hang on to forever. It still feels very meaningful to me yeah. that you are changing lives. And you know this yeah. now because you're a teacher. Yeah. And you, I mean, the number of lives you're changing all over the world, um, you're, I'm sure you're feeling exactly the same thing. If yeah. you can find the right situation. Yeah the right place and time, then, yeah, the world does need another pianist. Who thought, you know, whoever yeah. thought. So that's what it did for me. It was great. great. And, of course, when I met Roger, yes. William. The one before me. Right. <laughs> uh, this wonderful pianist that was one of my students there and – when I left Jamaica, I got the job at the University of Southern Maine right after that. And I left and I, you know, Jamaica would have been great, but I couldn't afford it <laughs> to stay there because yeah. I wasn't paid enough. And um, so I brought Roger, like after, like I was at Maine for one year and the next year Roger came and, um, and he did it, he did a degree and then he did a master's degree at um, Butler University. Uh-huh. And then we went back to Jamaica. So now he's the dean of the Edna Manley College uh, School of Music. And that's meaningful, you know, that, yeah. that that I had anything to do with that means a lot to me. Yes. Um, that he, and he was your teacher. Roger was my teacher. That's how we met. I studied right. with Roger for uh, two plus years or always like three years. Before Roger, I studied with Anne McNamee right. and Roger Williams. That was, uh, Roger came to USM in the early 90s. In 1990. Yeah. So since your first trip to Jamaica, it's been about 23 years. 33. 33 years. <laughs> My math was off. And you still go back to Jamaica every few years. Yeah. Masterclass. You were just there. Was it last fall, last uh, winter? Uh, November. November of last year. Yeah. What did you do down there this time? Same old thing. <laughs> you did concert this time? I did a concert, and I taught lots of uh, the piano students there. You know, individual lessons and master classes, and talked to them. And I didn't get out of Kingston. I mean, I was in Kingston for... 99% of the time. One day uh, with a friend drove up to Port Antonio for one night, but that was it. So I didn't go to the beach. No. I was in Kingston the whole time. Just teaching, hanging out, concerts. Wow. Yeah, I mean, just working at Edna Manley every day, you know, because that's the thing I go down there to do, really. As much as I love Jamaica, I love the beaches, I love the mountains, everything about it, you know. But the real reason is to go back and work with the pianists there. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. You're a big advocate of posture and alignment. Like, this is one of the things I discovered studying with you, just the, the attention you pay to posture, alignment, and, you know, just the shape of the hands out of all the master classes I've been in with different teachers and stuff. Not one of them stressed the importance as you do. Where did that come from? Um, so when I was in school, I was a junior in my undergraduate degree, I became injured from playing the piano wrongly. I was, Without going into great detail, I was just used, I was very tense. I was using bad, I had bad habits. 
And um, it was bad enough that I was either going to have to quit playing the piano or change. And so in the course of changing the way I played the piano, I, I've, I learned a better way. So it's through my own injury, really that first injury when I was about 20. Uh, I mean, it literally took me about three years to really recover from that and to really be able to play comfortably again. Was it hand injury? Yes, it was in my tendons in my arm. So it was it was related to the four of the fingers and pain along the outside of that the hand here in the arm, up the arm. I would get shooting pains up my arm, up to my elbow, anytime I used my fourth or fifth fingers on either hand. It was really bad. Mm. And um, so in the course of uh, dealing with that situation, I learned a lot. And I had to learn it. Because if I didn't learn it, I was going to have to quit. And I had the help, I, I want to give him credit, of a uh, colleague of mine, a, a fellow student, Mark Gibson, who is now on the faculty at the Cincinnati Conservatory. Um, he's a conductor now, more than, he's still a fabulous pianist, but he's a, he, his main thing is conducting. And um, he helped me. We kind of together worked out this way of, playing the piano. So uh, it was a remarkable experience. And then I came out of that and I was able to play and play well enough to do concert, to concertize and do international competitions, et cetera. And then I had my next big injury. Uh, I think it was about 1993. I slipped and fell backward on wow. my hand, you know, kind of slammed it back like this. It was my left hand actually. And um, it was, I tore ligaments in my hand, or yeah. And um, that injury, uh, I, through that, I got connected to Craig Williamson, who you took a class with, I'm sure. The yoga guy, right? <laughs> yoga. It was, he calls it somatic integration. Do you remember? Uh, Craig? Oh yes, I remember that class on a Saturday morning in the middle of winter. And all your students do it. The first time I showed up, I was like, we're doing a yoga class as a pianist. But that was one of the best class I've ever done. At first, I didn't really understand what he was doing. And by the end of the, 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 the session, I think it was like uh, for, for two, three months, I could really feel where tension was in my body. Yeah. and actively sort of disarm them, which so many pianists now I see struggle from. When they sit and they play, they're so tight and they're not aware of it. Because I remember back then too, I used to have a muscle spasm in the shoulder where after practicing for an hour or two, it was like a stone was in my shoulder. It was, the muscle was so tight and I'd be rubbing my back against the wall to see if I can get that knot out. And Craig's the one that helped me to got, get rid of it completely. Right. Well, yeah. Craig helped me in 1993, and that's when I met him. Um, and sort of the first session I had with him, I realized that I was a mess. <laughs> I had no idea how, what piano playing had done to my body. I had fixed like the hand thing and worked out the alignment stuff in the arms and the hands, but I had never dealt with the torso because I, you know, I didn't realize what a big deal that was until I started working with Craig and I worked with Craig for years and years and years and, you know, immediately started setting him up in with classes with my piano students, even before he was on the faculty at USM, I organized classes for him to work with my students. Um, because I, I saw the, import, the importance immediately. So it's always been part of, ever since I met Craig, it's been part of my teaching. Every single one of my students has to take his class. Even to this day? Yeah. He, it's now in the curriculum. Wow. Now an actual class at USM. This is, that, is this taught in any other universities, uh, to your knowledge? 
Well, what he does is different, but um, a lot of schools teach Alexander Technique or have new movement classes. Like the top schools really do. They, they, know, they understand the importance of this. Um, but what he does is a little different. It's uh-huh. not the same. And it's because he's worked with so many pianists and other musicians over the years, he's really become an expert on uh, our dysfunction, <laughs> our special brand of dysfunction in what we do. So he's helped countless students of mine. And uh, anyway, so that was another part of my technical growth. Because once I figured that stuff out, then it was, okay, that changes this in, in another way. And, uh, and, you know, in every piano lesson I've ever taught, I learned something new. Uh-huh. I learned, absolutely, positively learned something new about piano playing or technique or the psychology of all of this, every lesson. So I've been in school <laughs> the whole time, uh-huh. learning you guys and learning from teaching you guys a better way, a better way, a better way. So the, the, and the re at at the root of this is really a very simple thing. It's that the piano was not designed uh, for good ergonomics. It's a terrible instrument to play. You know, you can, you know, cradle your arms around a tuba. It fits your body, right? Um, you know, holding a clarinet, you know, I, it's not that big a deal. You know, it's it's right here. You don't have to move around. You don't have to, a piano keyboard is so wide and, Mm -hmm. and it, you know, and you end up having to twist your wrist in these weird positions to, you know, if you're having to play down here or up here, it's, um, or in, even in the middle, you got to get out of the way, you know, if you're playing in the middle of the keyboard, uh, there's, you know, you think of a marimba player, they don't sit on a bench and try to play way down here without moving. They walk over there. <laughs> yeah. Down there. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. they get to move with, uh, the length of the, of the keyboard, and we don't. We're stuck in the middle, stationary, and so the whole, the fluidity of your body on the bench is everything. It's everything. And it should be taught from the beginning as part, as a critical element in piano technique, how to move on the bench. So for um, those listening who doesn't have access to a guy like Craig, <laughs> just you. one advice would you give is how, how, how would you recommend they approach this thing of dealing with tension in your body? Do you think they should take a yoga class or something? I think um, yoga can help, but it's not exactly the same thing. Craig has a couple of books out there. Do you remember the titles? Um, I'll get that to you. Okay. And you post I'll, it. I'll post it in the... Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it, yeah. I mean, I think reading his books would be helpful. Um, but to say a few things about it. Mm-hmm. It's, um, yoga would be good in terms of developing that flexibility in your torso. Yeah. It is that flexibility in your torso that matters. Um, actually, belly dancing is, is, belly is dancing. a great thing. <laughs> all about being able to sort of fluidly move from side to side. <laughs> yeah, belly dancing. Yeah, I took belly dancing classes. It helped. If you can imagine, (laughs) don't think about it too hard. But yeah, I did take belly dancing classes. And I even at one point offered belly dancing classes to my piano students. I don't think you were there at that time. I didn't take class, but I had a friend who was coming over to the university and teaching belly dancing to my piano students. They loved it. Uh They really did. And it helped. It helped. Um, So tension comes from a, usually a very simple thing, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And your body is trying to compensate for that by getting tense or getting into some awkward position. So if you can find the right alignment for everything you're doing, 
you will eliminate most of the tension. So that alignment, you know, it has to do with hand position. It has to do with wrist position. It has to do with elbow position. It has to do with your torso, whether you're leaning forward, leaning backward from side to side, you know, back and to the left, back and to the right. It's kind of like water skiing. You know, you're, there's all these different positions that you can assume on the bench that will make it easier. So just starting from that standpoint that if you feel tension, chances are you are you yourself are causing it by doing the wrong thing with your body at that point. A lot of people raise their shoulder, like if they're trying to play down here and they don't make the accommodation in their waist, like by, you know, raising the, the right hip and leaning on the left. Is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know how to do this. You learned. Yep. Um, they they try to compensate by raising their shoulder. That's mm-hmm. what they do to keep from cocking the wrist in that position. Because if you lean this way, you'll end up cocking the wrist. If they raise their shoulder, they can get it up like this. Well, that constant raising of the shoulder is not good. Your shoulder should really have almost nothing to do with piano playing. Yeah. Storytelling. I think that could have been your second career telling stories <laughs> you're you're able to create the most brilliant stories from eight measures <laughs> of peace and i never remember what they were that's the problem it's I... absolutely amazing and you do that to get us to get into peace to be able to bring out melodic lines or chord progressions or just you know to interpret the dynamics how how do you how do you do that how are you able to see all these things in your mind <laughs> to create these stories, vivid stories from the pieces? Okay, let, rather than, because I don't know. <laughs> so instead of answering that, I'll, answer, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a different question and answer mm-hmm. that, which yeah. is, how can someone get better at that? How's that's that? That's a good one. Yeah, okay. that's a better one. <laughs> So I think um, there are a couple of things. First of all, you might have noticed, or maybe you didn't, but a lot of the the sort of stories that I might make up about something were kind of appropriate for the time period of the Uh music. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are completely not, and maybe those (laughs) are the best stories. Um, But... Very often, they are sort of more appropriate for the time period of, of when the piece was written. Uh, like, you know, in a Polonaise, a, a Chopin Polonaise, I might talk about the Polish military uh-huh. or the scene that's in, in, ensuing at a, in a ballroom if it's a Chopin waltz. You know, it, there's a scene there, and you can tap into that of the mid-19th century. Or the babushkas. The babushkas. <laughs> I love those ones. <laughs> I remember you dread, you put the, the, the thing, your scarf over your head once and you got the walk and everything. <laughs> I'm half That pulled. took me right back <laughs> to movies. <laughs> That's right. You did the F-sharp the F minor uh, Polonaise. I believe so. You did. The hard, the hard one. A really hard one. So how does someone begin to tap into that? Okay, so you actually have to know some history. Mm-hmm. History so of the pieces you're playing. Right. I mean, you actually need to know if you're going to, and I'm just talking about classical music here, but knowing what was going on in Chopin's lifetime, knowing what was happening in Beethoven's lifetime, you know, what is Beethoven all about has a great deal to do with, you know, the rise of the common man in the 19th century. And that was his thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't want to work for royalty anymore. He was a champion of the common man. And uh, Mozart was also dealing with class struggle and uh, outmoded ways of thinking in his operas. You can see that all the time. The women outsmart the men and the servants outsmart the, uh, the, uh, the ruling class. It's very revolutionary you know, music. Yeah. Um, 
and you tap into that? Well, I think, you know, there's knowing that, knowing the history that from where this music comes makes a different a difference because you can tell a story with a lot more confidence uh-huh. about what's happening if you actually can place the piece in time. So I would recommend if someone wants to get better at this to make that one of the starting points. Learn, Learn history. the history of the music. And I think that applies to multiple genres. Like a lot of the students that I teach say, you know, how do I get that sort of traditional gospel sound? But, you know, something that we were sort of exposed to growing up. And so it's easy for us to tap into that. So I would say first, go back and start to just listen. Probably read a few books about what was happening back then in the South and what was happening with blues and gospel back then. And then you can understand, you know, when the piano players do certain blues stuff on the piano, what it really re- represents back then. So that that's a very, very good idea. I've never thought about that in terms of that's, you know, that really helped to influence the storytelling part of music. So in it's other the, words, go ahead. The music, right. I mean, it's where does it come from? Because in some way, every composer is telling a story through their music. You know, if there are no words, I mean, the good thing about classical music is that they're actually words. So you don't have to wonder what the song is about. But if you're dealing with instrumental music, Uh you don't have words. So you have to, in some way, discern the meaning or impose meaning one way or the other in order for it to have meaning. For, for you as the performer and for the listener, knowing where it came from matters. And the, for those composers who did write, I'm talking about classical now, uh-huh. did write vocal music, people like Bach, um, Mozart, all of the opera that he wrote, Ma- Bach wrote masses, cantatas, um, Beethoven didn't write a lot of vocal music. It's a little harder there. It's a different kind of thing. Um, But Schumann wrote a lot of songs. Schubert wrote a lot of songs. Brahms did. For those composers that wrote vocal music, you have a Rosetta Stone. (laughs) You know, they were setting emotional music, emotional words to music, and there you can see what that kind of music me- means by looking at the words. So if you want to know, understand Schumann, study his vocal music. Because a lot of his piano works are influenced by the, the vocal stuff. Right. You can see the same kinds of melodies in his piano works. And you can say, okay, well, in that song, that melody represented this. Uh, that song about a flower uh-huh. or that song about heartbreak, you know, it, or that song about childhood, you know, it, it's, it's all there. You just have to look for it. In Mozart, it's unbelievable. You know, I don't think anybody should play Mozart if they don't know the operas. <laughs> full of all of the clues. You know, Marriage of Figaro, it starts out with Figaro measuring a floor. Well, we know what measuring a floor sounded like to Mozart. He wrote music for that. Amazing. So if you were to sum it up in a two-part process, becoming a great storyteller is necessary for really singing on the piano, so to speak. And the way to become a good storyteller, you got to study the history and you have to study the lyrics of the songs of the composers. Study the vocal music of those composers who wrote vocal music. Because that's the key to understanding their music. What did they mean? Uh, It's there. It's all there in the vocal music. Bach, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, It's not that hard. And then, of course, I'm a firm believer in seeing a lot of movies. Because, you know, movie music is loaded. With all kinds of, you know, these uh, musical gestures, you know, you know when something bad's going to happen in the movie. You can hear yeah. it in the music. Well, those guys who are writing that music are coming out of the classical tradition. Uh-huh. You know, they've heard that music. It's, it's the thunderstorm in uh, Verdi. Yeah. 
you know, or the diminished seventh chords all over the place in Liszt that have this <laughs> ominous sound in Totentance or, you know, some other evil piece that Liszt wrote. Those things are kind of universal. There are certain chords. The warrior's song. The lips of the, the chromatic medians. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. awesome. Exactly. So you can, you, there's a, listen, I think listening to movie music can be very, very informative because there's somebody thinking exactly the way I'm trying to think is, you know, what does this music sound like to me? It's the reverse. What does this scene that I'm supposed to write for, what does that sound like to me? That's uh -huh. what the composer is doing. Um, so I think there's a lot to be gained from just opening up your imagination and seeing those films that had great music written for them. Some of the great film composers. Uh, so there's something to be gained from that. And then I think reading a lot, being well-read, helps anybody become a better storyteller. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, and then I think hanging around children makes you a good story. <laughs> yeah, children definitely oh, bring that. Uh -huh. Are you finding that to be true? Uh, it's such an experience. So many things change, as you say, once you, you have a child. Like the whole notion of mortality becomes clear as day to you. You're like, oh my God. Things you never thought about before. You're like, wow. It's good. It's good. Informs other areas of my life that I just never thought about before. Right. And it's, isn't it funny? Like that might be the first thought you, it was almost one of the first thoughts I had after Gabriel was born was I am looking at the beginning of his life. You know, this is the start of his life and someday he's going to be an old man. And I'm seeing the beginning of the, of all of that. You know? okay. Is Gabriel, how old is he now? 25. And I, you, the last time we spoke, you said he was studying math yeah. in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Vancouver. <laughs> I know. And shut down. I don't know when I'm ever going to see him again. But right. Vancouver's a pretty safe place right now. So I'm glad he's there because they've done a really good job with controlling coronavirus. So yeah. he's, in, he's in a good situation. That's but great. he has another year there. He's doing his master's. Oh. Yep. Masters in math. My brain would explode. So would mine. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where <laughs> so I got one more question for you. What advice would you give to a youngin? Because I got a lot of people from ages 15 up that follow the channel. Someone who wants to pursue music as a profession. Because a lot of people, you know, even for me, started when I started in the Manly. A lot of them fell out. A lot of them are doing something completely different now. Right. Do you have any advice? Like, how does someone stay the course? Okay, I do have some advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah. Well, I think what you did is what, what I would say is, you know, you, if I had given... It's like I gave you advice and you did it. You did it on your own. I, that's the advice I would have given you, to do what you did. Um, get Find the best teachers you can, first uh -huh. of all, uh, and listen to them. <laughs> really listen to the teachers and find good ones. Yeah. Um, learn to read music, if you can. I mean, that will change everything. Because the name of the game in surviving as a musician is versatility. Yeah. And if you can't read music, it's going to be a handicap in a lot of situations. You might be able to do some things really well, but that extra element of being able to read will make you much more versatile and be able to have an easier time making a living. Yeah. <laughs> um, develop your technique as much yes. as much as you possibly can for the same reason doesn't really matter what you end up doing with it yeah uh and taking classical lessons is the best way to develop your technique that's why i did it 
That's right. You, I mean, I, like I said, I would have done, uh, my advice is to do what you did. <laughs> do um, what Lauren did. That you could find, you learn to read music. And it's not easy to learn to read music when you're 18. I that know. Because really I, was, I, was expo- I was exposed to piano first by ear. So then to start looking at a score and interpreting symbols, it was like the rug was pulled from out of my feet, I, you know, but. I did it. But it's literacy. It's just like learning to read, period. Mm -hmm. You know, think of what it would mean in your life if you couldn't read, how that would limit you. Yeah. And it may not be that bad a limitation in music because there are a lot of, you know, obviously there are a lot of successful musicians who don't read music. Mm -hmm. They're making a lot of money. Um, But I would say the versatility is a big deal. And if you uh, want to be a professional musician, try to be as versatile as you can. Right, right. You know, you might have a church job, you might have a teaching job, you might have a performance job, you might have a club job, you might, you might be composing, you might be, you know, any, any number of, you might be doing all of those things at once, like exactly. Lauren. I remember as a student, you know, I was playing rock and roll <laughs> at night, <laughs> Billy Joel, and then the next morning I was playing Beethoven in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, it became difficult to carry the two because, you know, the way you approach the music is differently. But, yeah, I was juggling both for a very long time. Yeah? Yeah. So do you ever play classical anymore? I haven't. The last time I played classical was my senior recital. Oh, really? Yeah, because, for one, there, there hasn't been any opportunity that presented itself for me to play. Um, two, 99% of the jobs I get, nobody hands me a score. They say, here's a YouTube link, or here's a CD, can you learn this? Um, so other than having to play hymns from a hymnal, there hasn't been any job opportunities to play classical. But you know, I always say that when I move, I'm getting a grand piano. Fly high, fly low, I'm getting a grand piano. <laughs> Then I can, you know, because I just, it doesn't feel the same on a keyboard. Right. I, I want to feel those ivory keys and see those strings ringing out inside a piano. But at some point, I'll, I'll jump back and, you know, dust off the old pieces for fun. But, I hope so. yeah. <laughs> it's fine. I love you just the way you are. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But for your sake, you know, you're going to want to teach your son to play. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really hoping he takes to it, you know. I'm hoping he takes to it. Yeah. But Are you going to start him with classical? He's going to be starting with everything. Swimming, dancing, classical. I would definitely start him with classical, simply for the stuff we, we talked about earlier. The technique, the posture the reading, the discipline, <laughs> you know, just all of those things I believe is what helped me to be the musician I am today. The focus, all of that stuff, it's good when you have that ingrained in you from early because it affects other areas of your lives. Yeah. I mean, having to sit there six months learning Rhapsody in Blue then comparing that to a three-minute song I have to learn for church, it just it makes it so much easier. And so a lot of people say, how are you able to retain so many songs? And how do you learn them so fast? And I said, well, I had to learn 20-page sonatas that took months to learn. <laughs> so when you go from that to learning three-minute pieces, it's like you know driving a semi-truck to a sports car. Right. It definitely opened up your brain in and memorization, stability, and all of that. Because I never thought I could memorize an hour worth of recital. I just, I didn't think it was possible. The way the brain just sort of compact the information. But also, that's one of the things you helped with, because I remember I was trying to memorize by rote. And I would, halfway in the piece, my memory would go, and I just don't even know where I am. And you've taught little tips and techniques of how to memorize, how to, you know, keep track of where you are, little exercises, like just 
point on the page and go. Start from different random spots throughout the piece or work your way backwards. All of those little things I've never done. So really help. I want to ask you one about playing gospel music. Mm -hmm. First of all, I mean, I've watched you do this and you do it so well that you feel like, I feel like you have such an emotional connection to it. Yep. So is that a new thing that you feel so connected to it or have you always felt that way? I have always felt that way because I, I was born and raised in the church. That's where I got my start was the guy at my church that would show me a few chords after service and I would go home and practice those. So I was always a part of the church, connected to church, uh, grow up in gospel music and Christian contemporary music. So even though when I started at Manly College studying classical music, I was still playing in churches on Saturdays and Sundays and I was playing that kind of music. Here at USM, I did the same thing. Um, I think it was two years in when I was at USM that I started playing at the Green Memorial AME Zion Church in Portland, which is the gospel church too. So after I graduated and, you know, I was playing pop music and rock music and all different type of stuff. And when time come for me to start this online endeavor now, I thought to myself, what should I teach? Because I could teach a little classical, I could play a little jazz, I could play some pop music, I could play gospel. And initially I did all of that on the channel. But then you get people who wanted more of the pop stuff asking for more. People wanted more of the jazz stuff asking for that. I was just trying to please too many people. Couldn't do it. I had to pick one style, one genre. And so I asked myself, if I were to get up every day and play a particular style of music, which one would it be? Was it classical? Was it jazz? Was it pop? Was it gospel? And it was gospel. Gospel is the one I, I could play this all day, every day. So then I just blocked out everything else and I just went full force with this. <clears throat> so that's where it came from, you know, it was, it was already there. Just so once I started watering that tree, it didn't take long to grow and blossom. But I had to learn a lot because, you know, a lot of the gospel stuff I teach is sort of like Southern style gospel. I grew up in the country of Jamaica. You know, so I had to do what you what you said earlier. I had to learn some of the history, right. Southern gospel and what it means to grow up in a Baptist church. I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist church, which is more classical leaning. So still learning a lot, you know, still learning a lot to really develop that authentic gospel sound. Sounds authentic to me, but <laughs> I'm getting there. Orthodox Church, and there was no gospel music. It was Byzantine chant. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I love listening to it, though. I mean, I love listening to you sing and play. I think it's so beautiful. Thank you. It really is. Okay. Really. I'm happy with what you're doing. I want you to know that. It doesn't need to be gay, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was a, a nice little little talk we have here. Yeah. It was nice catching up. It sure was. All right. So there you have it, folks. Lots to learn. Laura's uh, the one that helped me to develop this technique that I have today. You know, the, the love for the piano and really trying to get better in all the different areas. Reading, technique, posture and alignment was a big one. I no longer suffer from tensions all over my body. So thanks again, Laura. And I'll catch you guys next week in another tutorial. Remember to like, subscribe, and see you soon.